I'm Dr. Randy Martin, and we are here at the 2023 AGS Michael Conclave. You can easily hear over my shoulder, and I'm thrilled to be joined by two aortic superstar aortic valve surgeons uh, and excellent surgeons, Ismail El Hamamzi. Good to see you, my friend. Good to see you, Randy. And Meryl Ozunya. Perfect. I've, <laughs> nice I've to see you. I've got to look at my script. Thank you. We had never met, so I'm thrilled. I know about you, and then it's a fact. It's a pleasure. Thank you for joining me. We wanted to talk about aortic valve surgery, okay, obviously, but about where are we with the lifetime of a patient with aortic stenosis or aortic insufficiency. Let's say they're 50, 45. We do ROS, do we do repair? What do we do? Replacement? Ra? I think what we're learning right now in aortic valve surgery is that the life expectancy and the quality of life of a patient really depends on whether or not we can offer them reconstructive aortic valve surgery. Okay. And so if the valve is repairable, that is plan Z. First That's the first choice, repair of the aortic valve. Although in patients with valves that are marginally repairable, bicuspid valves that are very asymmetrical and where we think the repair durability may be compromised or the valve is clearly not repairable in aortic stenosis, for example, in a calcified valve, then ROS would be the choice for patients who have life expectancy that warrants an operation that is reconstructive. Yeah, so what we've learned, Randy, is that the use of biological or mechanical prosthesis in, in these younger individuals, anybody under the age of 65 or so, is associated in the long term with excess mortality versus the age and sex match general population. And that's all data that came out only in the last 10 to 15 years where we've been attuned to what is happening in the long term to these patients. You know, I think the focus over the last 30, 40 years was how can we do safe operations and get the patients out? Nowadays, surgery is so safe that the question has become, how do we make them live a life expectancy that is normal and a quality of life that is as good as possible? And the reality is, which was rather sobering for us as aortic surgeons when we look at our outcomes for isolated, elective, prosthetic aortic valve replacement in that patient population of patients under 65, that the reality is the survival is not quite the same as it should be. Right. And so that's where the whole interest in reconstructive surgery, things like aortic valve repair or the ROS procedure has emerged over the last 10 to 15 years and has really become the topic of interest of dedicated aortic surgeons like Morale and myself because that's the only way, just like with mitral valve repair, yeah, yeah. that we can put the patients back on a normal survival curve in the long term. It's interesting that the aortopathies that go along with a lot of aortic valve disease really influence, I mean, do they or do they not for repair? In other words, then that's why if you've got to do something to the root, are you going to do that with a repair? Are you going to? Absolutely. Okay. I think that's uh, sort of where uh, the initial valve sparing operation started with isolated root aneurysms without actually a lot of aortic valve pathology. Right. Tri-leaflet, normally functioning so valve with the principles. same principles. And if you have aortopathy and either with a bicuspid aortic valve or a tri-leaflet aortic valve, then a valve sparing operation with reconstruction of the right. root and potentially leaflet repair on top of that is the preferred option. In fact, let me add to this. We were just in a session right now that was on aortic root reconstructive surgery in combination with mitral valve repair. So a lot of these patients will come with an, a root right. aneurysm, some degree of aortic regurgitation, but a lot of those have also have Barlow, Barlow Marvin, band. they have Mar Barlow mitral valves. And so for the longest time, you would focus a lot of attention on repairing the mitral and then just do a bent on the aortic side or the aortic surgeon will come do a beautiful valve sparing operation and just put a, an alfieri stitch, which really doesn't last very long in right. these Barlow right. valves. And the feel now has evolved in a much more thoughtful and specific way and that's why we as aortic surgeons are here at the mitral conclave is because there's a lot more interaction between aortic and mitral surgeons around the patient so that the patient really gets the best of both worlds in terms of reconstructive aortic and reconstructive so mitral surgery. Is, and you do them concomitantly. Absolutely. But that's for a center where you've got, you, you both are outstanding aortic surgeons, but you got to have an outstanding mitral surgeon that's right. there too. So it's not for every place where somebody does you know, does a few aortics or a few modules, you really need a expertise. hundred percent. And that's where the, the concept of centers or reference centers comes into play. I think for the, in the mitral world, again, mitral repair is about 20, 30 years ahead of where we should be. So the concept of mitral reference centers, it has really become now an accepted notion and something that can be objectively measured through volume and outcomes and safety. We need to do the same thing on the aortic side 
And patients who have combined disease or who have connective tissue disorders who have some more of these, these conditions that require reconstructive expertise on both sides should really be funneled to centers of excellence. Morale, what, what would you say? Absolutely. These are not that common. No, that's, that's correct. And they're young patients who come mm -hmm. from really would benefit. In a younger patient, yeah. it matters a lot. Yeah. And so it does require dedicated expertise on both the aortic valve side and on the mitral valve side. So they really should be done in centers that can offer. So, offer. so let, me, uh, let me ask you two other things, because I, I could ask you a lot. <laughs> the Ross procedure, because I did echoes on a lot of, a lot of not so good Ross procedures in years gone by, is due to both of your expertise, is, has a resurgence going. Is it the operation of choice for patients with aortic disease in, and I believe that blank, who are a certain age or in certain conditions? Now? I would say so, yes. And I think what, the way we're doing it today is using all the lessons learned from the Ross 1.0 experience in North America, which was every right. center, every surgeon doing it at low volumes. And we now know that this is associated with poor safety and poor durability of the operation. So we are now concentrating these operations in centers of excellence, where there's more than just an aortic surgeon. There's a whole team around the patient of dedicated cardiac anesthesia, ICU, perfusion nursing that really allows for these patients to have excellent outcomes. The volumes of Rosses across North America have increased fivefold over the last three years. And the majority of these cases are performed in large volume reference centers. So I think it's a case of fool me once, fool me twice. Hopefully in this case, we won't be fooled a second time, right? <laughs> well, exactly. You learned about the pulmonary side of the, the Ross, because I used to see a lot of those problems. So. I think a lot of the principles around technical details around the Ross that prevent the late failures. This is what we've learned over the last few decades. And so, as Ismail said, it's uh, avoiding making the same mistakes right. as the first time around, where in, if you look at the papers where the outcomes were poor, the mean volume per surgery very, was no, very no, low, no. you know, less than a few over a 20-year period. I mean, it's shockingly low. And so we should not repeat that mistake. And so you really need dedicated focus and attention to actually wanting to offer Ross and not do it only a handful of times a year. I agree wholeheartedly. I'm, I'm a big fanatic on go, go to the place where the experts are for what you need done. Last question, Does it sound, may sound strange to you, does the directionality of the AI jet tell you about the pathology? I think it does and what you shouldn't do. And is that well recognized? 100%, the answer is yes. And it is increasingly recognized. For us who do this every day, we recognize it immediately. You see the echo, you know where the lesion is. The, uh, but there's a lot of educating to do, both on the surgical as well as on the cardiac side. As I said, and that's the reason we learn tons when we come to a meeting like this one, because mitral valve repair is so far ahead of where we should be but we can be where mitral valve repair is so in 10, 20 years. Jet can mean fenestration, prolapse, non-infection. Correct. And the mechanisms prolapse. are exactly the same. It's annular dilatation, leaflet prolapse typically. Correct the prolapse, correct the annular dilatation. We it's really the same principle yeah. actually as in mitral <laughs> valve repair, but our echocardiographers are just sort of coming, just waking up. Right. And so measuring the commissural angle, seeing how long the fused cusp is in a bicuspid valve, for example, and you know, get those things are very important clues for us to know whether or not the valve will be easily repairable or will require some advanced maneuvers. Jabrine had a um, fabulous echocardiographer. Yes. I knew I knew yes. very well. Yeah. And, and so and, and they were miles yeah. ahead of the way that they were approaching. So I think that's great. Well, I'm, I'm encouraged that, <laughs> that, 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 that uh, you know, Excellent aortic surgery is, is close at hand for us, for all of us. <laughs> so thank you both for joining us. Thanks, Randy. Fabulous. Thanks so much. Thank you. Good to see you in person. Thank you. And thank you for joining. Thank you.